problems with this last year. I know I did. So what are you going to tell us? Well, turns out, Jackie, that I have a recipe that I plan to share with you right now that uh, can recipe. really help us with this problem. So let me get to a screen share here. And wow, a recipe. I, I'm like so excited. Like Ooh, a so recipe for the garden. Yes, exciting, isn't it? So yeah. Um, let's see. I gotta get rid of some of this stuff. I guess here. Okay. So we're going to talk about inviting the beneficials, unfriending the pests, and we're going to do it with a recipe. So we're going to create a healthy garden. So uh, just for a little uh, credits here. This oh. My, so my beautiful backyard garden it used to be a lawn but not no more and so we're going to invite those beneficials here's some of them uh for sure everybody knows about the rock star earthworms right and we need them for lots of reasons but we really need the predatorials that are going to control our pest and so a ladybug is a predatorial and they are a vicious eater of other insects and then we want black wasps and we'll talk about that. A lot of people don't even know them, so we get to know them better. So how are we going to invite these guys and unfriend the pests that we all know that we have? And here is the recipe. It is compost, compost, and more compost. So you can't have enough of it. And I use it in multiple ways. We can't get into that this minute because we're going to run out of time if we do that. But we want lots of compost. Uh, this is a, just an extract. I'm extracting the compost off, or the microbes off the compost and water. It's rainwater or pure water. There's some compost. Next is plant diversity. You know, um, this uh, land that we're on, the planet we're on, it was not a monocrop. So as gardeners, we've got to get over that idea that we're going to plant a monocrop. So check out these tomatoes with the sweet alyssum underneath of it. And then this is a commingling of bee friend in our rock star trailing nasturtium over there. So some of which we want to add in as native plants to create a habitat. That habitat um, is perennial plants that are going to break down and their leaf litter is falling onto the ground, creating a habitat for beneficial beetles and spiders and things that we need that are going to eat pests. And so when we mow that off or we don't have it in the first place, they have no place to live. So you got to think they need uh, shelter, food, and water. Here's a closer up of that um, scene. So the big bunch grass in the back here. This is yarrow in the front. More bunch grasses back here, native plants here. And I sneak in potatoes wherever I want to. So it's not all not non-edible, but it's all productive. Okay. Oh, I just want to hang out there. What's that? I just want to hang out there. It's gorgeous. Oh, come anytime. Yeah, that'd be great. And then uh, reducing disturbance. Um, seems to be a new thing, but it's an old thing that we just need to get back to thinking about and doing. Uh, this is uh, Laura's garden, and it's a regenerative garden now, but she keeps everything mulched. And so that mulch is um, making its own compost in place. And then the walkway is the white Dutch clover that I was talking about in my high tunnel. That's in the walkway, permanent walkway. Just remember, this is where we came from. This is what it used to be like, right? Lots and lots of different plants in one location. We need to be a helping hand with this whole deal. Um, so we need to understand a little more about the plant itself, when it's producing um, sugars, when it's doing its best photosynthesis, and when it's not. And so the best way to do that is a re refractometer and um, put a little plant sap on it, put it up to the light and see what the reading is. This is a reading off of some salary, which most people that know a lot about a refractometer says that can't be a salary. Salaries are usually lots lower than it but it can be. So the higher your sugars are in that plant, the best defense that has and has no stress going on when that's happening. So it's kind of a way that we can look inside that plant and see what's going on. So wait, can I ask a question? Sure. 
if people don't know, because we got a re can you go back to that side? We got a refractometer and it took us a while to figure out like what's the score in that? Is it a thirty, a fifteen? What it's yeah. it's the blue, right? So we're reading this blue white line. So this one reads fifteen. And uh, that's how much sugars the the plant sap has sugars in it, and the light beam is bending over the sugars when you look through the refractometer. So where they normally use a, a lot is in wine and beer making, but we can use it with the plant sap. So I just took the plant leaf, crumbled it all up, got it all liquid, put a little drop on the lens there, and then put it up the light and read it. A lot of vegetables are going to be way down in here because they're not producing much sugars. And we'll get into that a little bit further when we get into these questions. But the higher that sugar is, the healthier the plant is. If you compare it to one you get at the store, you probably won't even get like between a five and a 10. And I got a refractometer off of Amazon for 17 bucks last year at the school. Yeah, and I got a link to one in our uh, in the YouTube's uh, description to make it easy for you to find one. Because you don't have to spend any money. There is expensive ones, but you don't have to. So lots of people can't get enough compost, and I understand that, and it's, it can be a lot of work to make it. So um, I always grow some. So these, this is comfrey, and this is one plant, or I started with one root in there, and now this is my mother plant where I can go in and dig up roots and give them to other people or move them around, whatever. But it takes, um, it takes up some space over time. So I put them underneath the fruit trees and in corners of yards, kind of wasted spaces. The pollinators just love them. I mean, early in the morning, if you want to find a pollinator, you go here and you're going to find them. Right? They just are crazy about it. And I, you can cut this off. I cut it off three times a year in my northern climate, cut it off, and then I make it into a, a plant tea where this is, I put in some diversity of plants in this mix. This is yarrow, um, red clover, comfrey, and then some kale that was going to waste. And then I put it in a burlap bag, and then I seep it in water, preferably rainwater, but any pure water will work. And then uh, I think about three days, which are easy recipes you can find on the internet as to how to make comfrey tea. Then this, this is highly concentrated microbes now. And then I'll dilute that with more water to put out onto the plants and, and to spread all over the place and whenever, whenever it's needed. So the next recipe to success is we need to be a helping hand with the watering. And I'm just as big a culprit as anybody else at this because most people are watering a little bit every day or every other day. We need to stop that. That's a really bad habit. We need to deep water once a week. Now in container plants in a greenhouse, it may be a different story, but if they're in the ground, it needs to be once a week with a really deep watering. That's gonna create really deep roots for those plants because those plants are gonna chase the water. They get stronger, healthier. They're able to go out and work with more soil microbes in community and get more nutrients that way and they're not stressed. Unstressed plants don't have pests and diseases, very rarely. So that's one big ticket that we need to be understanding. Another more newer thing that we are doing or understanding is that there, we need to increase the chitin in the soil to help um, with some of these pest problems, especially with beetles. And so it's just uh, crab shells and lobster shells. And this one is a liquid. You can buy powdered ones. There's several of them you can do. I've been adding it um, maybe two or three times a year to try to build that up to um, combat some flea beetle problems. So our next recipe to success is know when to get out of the way. I don't know how many gardeners see an insect or aphid colony start and they panic. They're like, oh my God, I gotta get rid of them, right? Well, I want you to unpanic, start getting out, maybe get a handheld microscope, if you can't see these guys, and check it out before you do anything at all, right? So these, this was a colony of aphids, 
right up here, that one, and maybe this one are still alive. This one is still alive. The rest of these are mummies, and they have already been um, killed with the black wasp. Right here is a black wasp. There is a black wasp. They're tiny. Okay, and so those black wasps are laying their egg inside the aphid. Every black wasp will lay 200 eggs. So every one of these cocoons is going to turn into a black wasp that can kill 200 more aphids. And they do it quickly. I've seen a greenhouse turn over from being solid mass of aphids to literally you can't find any in 10 days. That is just amazing. So we need to know when to get out of the way. Um, of course, we all know our lady beetle. Anytime we start seeing lady beetles and flies and ants hanging around, there's some aphids there, but that's okay. They're just making a community and they're helping all of these other guys live a life cycle. Aphids, um, we can get into a little bit deeper, I think, here in a minute. But we need to know when to not do anything, which is most of the time. Last but not least, we need to stop overloving our plants. I don't know how many people over fertilize, especially in nitrogen, because these dark green luscious color is our desire, right? We just love that. And it releases feel good hormones in humans and it makes you feel really, really good. <laughs> but they don't need the nitrogen. The, there's free nitrogen everywhere, and the microbes convert that nitrogen into a soluble nitrogen for those plants. These that you're looking at have not had nitrogen ever put on them, other than in the compost or some fish emulsions. None. So we need to stop with the miracle Grow and any other NPK thing that we think we need. We don't need it, right? We're actually causing huge problems by putting it on. So we have to kind of think, okay, maybe I just really need to go in the house. Maybe you just go out and harvest and don't do the other stuff you might think about doing, but deep water. Okay, so I'm sure after that recipe, we might have a few questions. So what do we got, Jackie? <laughs> uh, sorry. Lacey from Garfield County wants to know, how does she deal with grasshoppers? They eat everything to the ground last year. Ooh. Hi, Lacey. Um, yes, um, eastern and central Montana was inundated completely with grasshoppers. I saw a video. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't have any in my environment. Um, there was some gardeners in our area that did, and almost everybody else that I know was wiped out by them. Right, so they, they can be a huge, huge problem. I used to have grasshopper problems, grasshopper problems when I had a garden next to a track field, right? So that's more their native habitat out in the grassland. That's where they want to live. That's where they do live. And so when we start gardening in one of their habitats, then we're going to have to start thinking, how, do, how am I going to get along with this? And how am I going to deal with this until I can get my plants built up high enough in these sugars? Because once that plant's got high enough sugars, the grasshoppers or anybody else that wants to eat the plant can't digest that, and they die. So they just stay away from it. And um, a really healthy plant with high brick sugars in it is um, sending out positive signals. A plant that's low in bricks is sending out very bad signals for pests to come in. And uh, um, Jonathan Lundgren, who's my Buddy that's an entomologist, he says they literally can see them from miles away. It's almost like radar that they can see plants that are sick sending out these signals and they can't see the healthy ones. But when we move into the prairie, like I did with the track field example, um, my plants were very inviting to them because they were lusher and they were greener than when the grass starts maturing. I think grasshopper eats a quarter or a third of its body weight a day. So as those grasshoppers increase in size, they, it's just like a cow that's growing. They're going to have to eat a lot more, right? So when those grasses turn brown out in your prairie or around my track field, 
then they're going to come after anything green. It doesn't really matter, other than they don't like winter squash and they don't prefer tomatoes. There are certain plants they don't prefer. They'll wipe out the others first. But I give them a place. So they're going to be there no matter what I do. So I give them a place to live. So all around the outside of my garden, I over-irrigate and I let grow tall. So the taller, lusher that grass is, that's where the grasshoppers are going to go. If I had chickens, that's where I would herd the chickens every single day, right? The chickens just love grasshoppers and they would be devouring them. Now, when we are in a situation where we are today in Montana, because we had an epidemic of them last year, they've laid eggs and they're going to hatch, then I would bait those grasshoppers with the beneficial, um, I think it's a protozoa, that they put in the bait. The grasshopper eats the bait. That grasshopper now has protozoa inside of it and they're going to get killed from the inside out. But other grasshoppers eat the dead grasshoppers because they cannibalize. And so then they kill masses amounts of them with this biologic. And so I get a hold of the county extension agents to find out where to get that um, the least expensive. And I would be baiting them, Lacey, ahead of time. Plus, my those, those dead grasshoppers probably make food for the worms and stuff. Well, they're making chitin. So mm -hmm. chitin is your exoskeletons. And so all that stuff's breaking down, going into <laughs> So does that help you, Lacey? Yeah, it does. I have a couple questions. Um, you mentioned talk to county extension to get that those that protozoa bait. Is that also available from that Neptune or that Air Aribico or yep, um, Aribico will have it too. Yep. Okay. And then when do you, you say bait early, what does that mean? Like snow on the ground early or May early? Well, that's when you want to kind of work with your county extension. They would know when those grasshoppers are hatching as soon as they hatch and they start eating. Um, then you'd want to bait. Like some people, I think, wet down a place, a low spot to, to bait in. I'm, I've never done the baiting, so I don't know for sure, but that's why you'd want to talk to your agents. They should be able to help you, or the company itself would should be able to help you. How to get that applied. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You bet. Anytime we can put in habitat that's uh, flowering and, and diverse on the outside is going to help us. Okay, what else we got, Jackie? <laughs> I just have to say hi. I didn't know anybody else that there was just you and me. <laughs> uh, okay. Valley County gardeners have big problems with flea beetles. They ate the broccoli, radishes, and Brussels sprouts last year. What did they do? Okay. Um, yeah, they were, they were a huge problem in our area. And I'm sure lots of the dry, hot areas, flea beetles love dry and heat. They're just like a bandit. And the more canola fields you have around you, the more of them you have because they, they love that whole family. Canola's in that family with the mustards and your, your uh, radishes and your kales and broccoli. And so is, sweet, is, um, so is the trailing nasturtium, which is here, and the sweet alyssum. Both of those are all in that family, and these kales are in that family too. But when the um, flea beetles come out, they're probably going to attack the nasturtium because it has some sort of chemicals in it that draws them to that plant. And that's why I plant the trailing ones. This one will get really big and trail clear outside this planter. And so then they're big enough to handle the attack and they keep kind of draw the flea beetles away from those other plants. All plants that you want to protect from flea beetles other than your radishes, your radishes and any like baby kales or anything like that, you need to plant super early, just as soon as the frost comes out of the ground, you get to go in on the plant those really early cold um, crops. The others I plant in the greenhouse. So they're already a big plant. As soon as that soil temperature is warm enough, I'll plant the big plant outside, right? So then that big plant, I'm gonna take on through the summer. The little plants are what I'm gonna be harvesting as greens and eating them quickly because any flea beetle, any pest, is gonna like the green, um, fresh growth better than they will a mature, tougher plant. And those plants that are started in a greenhouse, and I'm gonna get into that in a second, I think, but I dip them 
the seed into a compost extract and that coats the seed. And then when the seed germinates, the radical, which is the root, has all those microbes attached to it. And they, they just get healthier and healthier and bigger and bigger and happier just from that one application, that compost. So if you don't have a lot of compost, that's for sure the very first way that I would use it as a, as a seed treatment. So once those plants are big and healthy and you have your bricks high in them, they're sending out signals that the, the pest, even the flea beetle, won't want anything to do with. Your others are gonna be sending signals that says, yeah, come, come get me. Um, I'm gonna to get to a picture here, I think, um, of them. Kind of have to hang with me. Yeah. Sorry about that. I've got a couple of them, I guess. Well, I might get to that picture. Um, these are all beneficial plants that you want to be kind of thinking about putting in. Get into that in a second. Oh, I just had this way back there. Here it is. So, this plant, what do you think it's doing? It's got high sugars, it's happy. What about this one? No, not so much, right? Sugars are lower in that plant. This plant's getting attacked. It's still growing, still working at it. This one back here, healthy as could be, side by side. Okay, flea beetles are doing this damage. Flea beetles are like, hmm, I don't want nothing to do with that plant, but they love this plant. And they'll get so bad in certain plants. I had other plants in a different location that they were just killing, wiping them completely out. Not six foot away was another healthy kale untouched, right? So it has to do with the nutrition of that plant and some varieties are more susceptible than others. This is a, a blue kale or purple red kale and it was more susceptible than these green ones. So as gardeners, we start catching on to that trick. Well, next year I probably won't put in too many of the blue purple ones, at least not here. If I want them, I'm gonna put them in the greenhouse I have not near as many flea beetle problems in the greenhouse. I have zero grasshoppers in a high tunnel, greenhouse or high tunnel, zero grasshopper problems in those environments. You can get flea beetles in there, but it's not as likely. So one of the real tricks with the, any of these insects is knowing the life cycle. So life cycle in a flea beetle, um, they live out their life cycle in the ground. So anything that has its life cycle finish and start in the ground, which they do, can be defended by other things in the soil. So like beneficial nematodes in the soil and other beetles eat the beetles' eggs. And slugs actually eat their eat beetle eggs. In so we got to kind of start learning a little bit some of that. But uh, flea beetles uh, is going to have two life cycles, at least in Montana, in my region, further south, they're going to have three. And so the first one doesn't seem like, well, there's not that many of them. You know, you think, well, I'm, I'm dealing with these guys and live with them fine. And then they go back in the soil, lay more eggs, and then come July, late July. And all of a sudden, you're like, you come home from vacation, you're like, oh my God, the whole garden is inundated with flea beetles, right? Because every one of them that laid eggs, they hatched them. Now they're in hot, dry summer, they're ideal condition, and they flourish. But their life cycle is not that long. So this was, this picture was taken, I think, in late August. Okay, so that's pretty deep into that flea beetle thing, but what else we got, Jackie? Everyone wants to know how to deal with aphids. How do we help gardeners deal with aphids? Oh, let's see what we got here. That's a flea beetle's life cycle. And Patty, you just know so much. Uh, so here's a quick thing though before we leave, or well, we are going to talk about the aphids. So this is part of the life cycle of the aphids. We need to understand who's who. Um, there, here's a colony of aphids. These are, these are mature ones. These are baby ones. Um, they actually can birth live offspring that can have a baby, so they really don't need much time. This is a mature winged aphid. And so is this one. Oh. This is another kind of round back here. You think, oh, I got some flies in the greenhouse. Well, maybe not. 
So we need to know, this is when they decide, oh, this population is super high, I'm gonna go lay eggs somewhere else and start a new colony somewhere else. This is a aphid getting, it's getting, the black wasp is laying its egg in the aphid. So the black wasp um, is like any other wasps, it's got a long rear end to it. And these are the good guys. These guys are the bad guys. So we need to kind of know a little bit about that. Here's uh, Kirsten over to sleep in Buffalo. These are black aphids in the radishes. Aphids come in lots of colors. There's lots of different kinds of aphids. Here's some green aphids. This looks like a monstrous colony, right? Like all of a sudden it's panic city, but look close. Look at all these little black guys. Those are wasps and they are already laying eggs. As soon as you see one of those little brown red ones there, you can go in, have a cup of tea, have coffee, forget about it, because they're gonna take care of it for you. You just need to know who's who. Here's another example of them, right? Here's the cocoons getting bigger. This one's ready to pop open. They, the wasp will chew a little hole in it and come out, and then they're off and running, all those are wasps. And so we just need to kind of pay attention to who's who a little bit. Here's some, you can see the hole in that. They've already hatched. This is in the, um, getting ready to be fall. The leaves are falling on the ground. What does a gardener do with their leaves? What do they know? Well, take them to the compost. A lot of people take them to the dump even. Leave them alone. <laughs> All right, if the aphids were in the sunflower or whatever it was and the black wasp come in, those eggs are in that duff and material, leaf litter on the ground, leave it alone. Then come when aphids come in the spring, these guys are already there. I've actually had the black wasp ahead of the aphids. They got to hang out and chill and wait for the aphids to start their life cycle. Just leave some of that alone. Uh, let's let's leave it to that because we could go in a whole show about aphids. But uh, to invite more beneficials in, though, let's get some dill, fennel, carrots. Let them go to seed because they have um, flowers that attract a lot of beneficials. So lots of beneficials. The more flowers you got, the better. I've had gardeners tell me, "I'm not planting a flower." I can't eat it. Well, they can. There's a lot of them they could eat. But the old theory is that if I'm, if I'm a vegetable gardener, I'm only growing vegetables and not flowers. I'm not a flower gardener. That needs kiboshed, right? That's got to get out the window. Because I put in a bit, about 10% flowers to 90% to greenhouse or garden vegetables if I'm really wanting to be in high peak production. I'd go as high as 30% flowers, if I just want to really invite the beneficials and take care of things. So one beneficial plant that I have always, and you've seen it underneath those uh, tomatoes in that greenhouse, this is sweet alyssum, and it's old style, old fashioned sweet alyssum. It's not a hybrid, it reseeds itself. And so in my high tunnel, it's still in there and I let it self-seed. My goal is for it to make its own mat come spring that I don't have to keep planting flats of sweet alyssum. So if I don't disturb the soil, I have a really good chance of that. If I go in and even hoe around, then I'm destroying them. So I kind of let those do their thing. This is Laura's garden and the hoe outside of her garden is flowers every year. Um, she changes it up different years of what flowers are out there, but there's always flowers and they're always um, breaking down, decomposing out there. So they're, they kind of make this uh, habitat for the beneficials of all kinds, not just the pollinators that really, really help the garden. Because she, she doesn't probably have 10% inside the garden, but she sure does when she counts to the outside borders. So other things we can do is create a trap crop, which Lacey's gonna do with her grasses. And lots of people need to be doing that with radishes for flea beetles. Any mustard, they love mustards. So I had to, um, when the flea beetles did start showing up in my place, I'm like, all right, I planted a planter with mustard in it. 
and I put this garbage bag underneath of it. And then those mustards were barely up and going. I bet they weren't four inches tall when flea beetles found it. And they're like, they're just like a magnet to it. They're like, hey, look, something that's young, tender. And they, they just go, they were like black on it. I'm like, ah, I've got you guys. So I watered the plant. So you get the leaves all wet and gooey. And the flea beetles don't like that at all, right? So they go down on the ground, wait for that plant to get um, dry and warm before they go back up into campy. And so when they were down on the, onto the soil, I just unwrapped that garbage bag and tucked it right up, sealed it up, and I took it out in the, in the open area and let it bake in the sun. And I killed them all, right? So that you can trap but you got to plan on how am I going to trap stuff? Like I trapped with aphids this year, or with radishes this year. I planted the radishes clear back by the compost to draw them away from my broccoli and kales and Brussels sprouts. So those are some ideas on trap crops. Okay, any other questions before we wrap this up? No, but there was some kind of resource about a passive solar aquaponic greenhouse. I don't have any other questions on the list. Okay, no, that's good. Anybody else got a question or they wanna talk about anything? Lori's got a question. Patty, I have, um, I, I'm wondering, Patty, like um, you're putting compost tea on your soil. Um, when do you start and when do you stop? Like in, in, in the year as it's like, as we have winter and Right. Let's, I'll walk you through that. Like I, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I had compost in the high tunnel, right, to keep it from being as frozen. I actually have some on a root cellar, right? So I have some that's not frozen. So I had to pre-plant that, right? I had to do that planting in the fall. So I have some compost available to me that was really good compost that's not frozen. And that I'm going to make into an extract. I'm going to add in um, worm castings and... Um, Maybe, maybe a little bit of kelp, but not much. Mostly it's compost and worm castings. And then I'm gonna extract it into rainwater or pure water if I don't have rainwater, I prefer rainwater. And then I'm just gonna get that liquefied. I'm gonna leave that highly concentrated. I'm not gonna dilute that. And that I'm gonna to use to mist all the seeds. With I used to use a watering can because I'm doing it in a greenhouse scale. So I just lay the seeds out onto the um, planting trays or in the plugs water can the, the highly concentrated compost extract on top of them, then put the soil on top of them, pat them down. And that is what's gonna get you the really big, long, deep roots that I was talking about. And that's the start, right? And then as soon as they come up, they get going within a week, 10 days, then I go ahead and, and um, I give them more. And so then it's maybe once every week or every two weeks, I'm giving some to them to, uh, to just kind of, you're just boosting the numbers of, uh, of microbes. I'm trying to get to go in the right direction here. Slideshow. Microbes in the in your environment. So the more of them you have, the better off you are. So you can't put on too much. And I'll continue to do that throughout the year. So once the plants aren't growing anymore, are yeah. you just until it, the ground is frozen or, or you don't I, have any more? When the, grants have, <laughs> the plants have quit growing, there's probably not much need to put it on unless okay. um, what I do put on in the fall or late summer um, with these flea beetles because we're just in a historic place that really has them. We know we have them. And so I'll put on a beneficial insect or, or in beneficial nematodes that I buy to, uh, to deal with them, right? Because their life cycle will start again early in the spring and they eat their eggs, destroy them in the ground. So that's where I'm talking about where if we have a pest that lives out of its life cycle and in, ends in the soil, then soil microbes can handle that and start working with it. But here's an example of the 
compost extract and what it can do <clears throat> for your plant roots. So this planter was in a, it's in a pallet, so it's about 32 inches long. This is a uh, triticale and it was a science fair experiment, experiment. And so they just put the extract on triticale seeds and the other plant next to it was over here, right? Didn't get anything. So this is the bottom of the plant roots that didn't get any concentrated compost. This one's roots went clear to the planter's bottom, 32 inches long. They probably would have went longer if our planter had been bigger. That's with one treatment. We didn't add any more compost extracts to this plant. That's it, that's all I got. It got the initial seed treatment and that's it, nothing else. So like I say, if we can do anything with our best compost, that's when we're gonna use it is on that seed. That is amazing. You guys wanna see a video from these girls? Yeah. That? If that doesn't sell you on what to do with your best compost, I don't know what will. <clears throat> what do you got, Eileen? You got a question? No, nope. she's a sold on idea. <laughs> yeah, thumbs up, right? Any other questions, Jackie? Nope, we're good. We are good. Okay. I, I question. Patty, do you, can you hear me? Yep. Um, I didn't get, I, we don't have good compost going. How would you source some to get started? Um, not even to start my own pile, but to um, like treat the seeds this spring. How, where would you do that? Um, well, you're close enough to me that I can get you some, but there's places that we can buy it. So there's some uh, compost people that are, that's what they do. I mean, they're, they're looking at it under the microscope and know the whole soil food web or not as best as we know it, right? We're just barely babies learning this stuff. But then they, they market it, and so we can get it. You can get it online, too, that I'm not sure how much the quality is that way, you know. But, um, yeah, I would get it from somebody that's actually actively making compost. You can start a worm bin. Yep, worms are great. You're an all right. I put worm castings in with everything I do, you know, so I, a lot of times I'm saying compost extract, but the worm castings go in with it, right? And the worm castings underneath a, a microscope that are really good worm castings are just unbelievable. So I have a whole pile that's um, probably four or five foot wide, three foot tall, six foot long that's uh, wood bark and wood chips um, from tree trimmers, and I put plant waste in there food waste in there, and it's full of worms, red wiggler worms. So anytime I want to get something, I just pull back some of their material, shovel down in there, and I've got as good a black gold as you can imagine. I haven't had to do anything other than I throw some water to it once in a while. So I would put that in a shaded location. You could do it in your hedgerow, Lacey, at your place. Lori's got some spots there by her fence and wood thing that she could do that. Um, don't have to have a bend, right? You can do it. When I you first can, I mean, I had a worm bin in my classroom. Like if you wanted to start your compost in January and you haven't started outside, you could have a worm bin in your kitchen or your garage or your laundry room where it doesn't take much space. Yeah, and it's great for kids. Um, you know, homeschooling or in a classroom, either one, 
it's uh, it's really good and doesn't cost that much to get going. You could probably find used ones of people that got tired of doing it if you really got serious about it. So what do we got, Jackie? Our time's running long today. We better get going. Yeah, we got to go. So uh, let's see. What do we usually need to say here then? <laughs> oh. Um, young new show that we don't. Our time is almost up. How do people get more information? <laughs> well, uh, there's a couple ways. You can look at the YouTube when I, I post these on YouTube after I've got the recording made and I put in the description there. I'll, that's where I put in books of what I've learned, some of my knowledge from of what I talked about this week. I put that in there. I put some products that are. Um, affiliated to Amazon in there of products that I grow that I or use that I know are reliable. So you can go there too for information. Okay. So what are you going to talk about next week? Next week. Yes. Oh, we're going to plant. We're going to start. Look, where'd I go with them? Look what I got in the mail. I got seeds. So um, next week we're going to plan <laughs> how we're gonna do the seeds. Because um, so many people don't necessarily start the right seed at the right time. And then come June, you're like, how come my, my peppers are so small? So we're gonna make a plan next week. So we're gonna have a little more planning session next week on our deal. And for people who are seedlings on our Patreon page, you could join us for the after show and hang out in the Zoom where we will answer more questions. Yeah, we normally do that, Jackie, but this week we gave you the after show in the show. So, uh, hi. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to have to uh, call it good. Jackie's got an interview coming up here from the Green Grower podcast, if you recognize her voice. If you haven't listened to her podcast, you should because she interviews the biggest rock stars in this uh, growing world in the world. On her podcast. So, like Patty Armbruster. Till, well, I don't know about that, but so. I do. Till next week. Woo, Patty, Saturday, people. Woo. Next Saturday, we will be back with Grow Live and look forward to seeing you then. And if you got questions, send them to us. We can always plan a show around your questions if we know what they are. Okay, till next week. Grow healthy. Thanks for coming today, everybody. What a surprise. <laughs>